Section 5.1 Introduction to G-Code Development Now, let's cover a brief introduction to G-Code Development. As you may have guessed, Frank the Construction 3D Printer does not speak English because, well, Frank's a robot. Instead, Frank speaks a different language that most other types of plastic, resin, and concrete 3D printers also speak, and that language is called Geometric Code, or G-Code. But don't worry, you don't need to be a coder or learn any new languages to communicate with Frank. That's because we have created a proprietary plugin for the AutoCAD and Revit softwares, which allows you to simply draw a few lines, click a single button to automatically create the 3D print pattern, and then export the drawing in the G-Code language format, all in just a few short minutes. In this section, we will give you a brief crash course on how to create G-Code for a building using our proprietary AutoCAD plugin, how to run a simulation to test how the G-Code works, and how to extract a couple of key numbers from AutoCAD that will be used to accurately position the G-Code on the building's foundation when we're printing out in the field. Let's jump in. This is AutoCAD one of the most commonly used architectural softwares. Similar to SketchUp, it's a relatively simple software to operate, especially in the way that we'll be using it. For the purposes of this demonstration, we'll be making a small 20 by 20 foot tiny home that can be printed from a single position. I'll begin by drawing some simple lines to represent the exterior surfaces of the building. I'm working in architectural units, or feet and inches, so I'll select the line tool, click one time to start drawing a line, move my cursor to the north of where I started, and then type in 20 apostrophe, or 20 feet, to draw a line 20 feet in length. Then I will draw another perpendicular line to the east that measures 20 feet in length, and I'll draw a third line to the south that also measures 20 feet. Now we have three separate lines which represent the exterior surfaces of the west, north, and east facing walls of our building. But let's add a final wall on the south side of the building with an opening for the front door. There are a few ways that you could draw this, but I'll simply draw three separate lines, a 8 foot 6 inch line for the first part of the wall, a 3 foot 3 inch line for the rough opening width of the door, and then a final line to close out the structure. We don't need the 3 foot 3 inch line we used for the rough opening width, so I'll erase that line. Now, we have a very basic outline of a building, and honestly, it's pretty boring, so let's add a curve to one of the corners. I can do this by selecting the Fillet tool, typing the letter R for radius, and it asks for the size of the radius, so I'll type in 3 apostrophe to specify a 3 foot radius. Now, I'll select two of the intersecting lines at the top right corner, and AutoCAD automatically draws the curve. At this point, I'm happy with the basic shape and size of this simple tiny home, and as a quick side note, if you already have a floor plan in SketchUp or another CAD software, you could simply import that floor plan to AutoCAD and delete all but the perimeter lines of the building to arrive at the same point we have here. Now, there's one more thing that we should do, which is to use the Join tool to merge all of these lines into one single line which will be important in just a minute when we create the 3D print pattern. To do this, select all of the lines in the print section and then click the Join Tool icon in the ribbon bar or simply type in the word Join followed by the Enter key. Now, when we click on one of these lines, we can see that they have all been merged together into a single line. Again, you'll see why this step is important in just a minute. If you turn your attention to the top of the screen, you can see several tabs, starting with the Home tab and ending with the Featured Apps tab, all of which are there by default with the AutoCAD software. We need to load our proprietary AutoCAD plugin, which will give us two additional tabs up here and allow us to generate the print pattern automatically. To load the plugin, I'll type in the command netload and then select the AutoCAD plugin file. 
by doing this. We just added two additional tabs at the top of the screen. These are the Patterns Generator tab and the Trace Maker tab. Start by selecting the Patterns Generator tab. On the far left side of the ribbon bar, we can see the Make Offset section and a button to Build Pattern here. Now watch how easy this is. Select the line that we just joined together, and then click the Build Pattern button and boom! In a split second we have our trace line. We call this green line the Trace, and it's the digital line that's created in AutoCAD which defines the center of the extruder's toolpath. The trace is the same shape and size as the toolpath, but it's slightly different in that the trace is the digital line in AutoCAD, while the toolpath is the physical path the extruder follows during operation at the construction site. You'll learn why that's an important distinction later on when we talk about snapping the G-code to the foundation. Now, turn your attention to this corner of the building in the northwest corner. See how when we clicked Build Pattern, the software automatically knew to create wall cavities here in the corners, and also to create a continuous wall around this corner. The software knew we wanted to do this because we joined all of the lines together into one single line, which is how to tell the software that we want to create one continuous wall instead of separate detached walls. If we would have left the lines separated, then the trace would have looked something like this, which is obviously not correct. Now, one last thing before we export the G-code. We have to define where the trace will begin and finish, which will tell the printer where to start and end each layer. This is also a really simple process, which we'll accomplish using something called command lines. To create a command line, we will need to go back to the top of the screen, to the Tracemaker tab. Before we dive in and start creating command lines, let's take a quick second to think about where we want to start and end each layer. In some cases, it's better to start with the infill material, while in other cases, it's better to start with the exterior surfaces. We are currently creating an entire new course for those who want to become a certified G-Code developer, where we will cover this topic in depth. But for now, let's just say we want to start with the exterior envelope first, and then do the infill last. If we zoom in here, you can see that there is a break in the exterior envelope line that was automatically created by the software. This is where we will define the first point, or starting position, using a command line. Defining this line as the first point would mean that the extruder would move around the wall in this way with the exterior envelope first, while defining this line as the first point would mean the extruder would move in the opposite direction with the interior of the building first. Let's choose the clockwise direction. To do this, we'll select the Line tool by clicking the letter L on the keyboard, and we'll start our new line here. With command lines, it only matters where the line starts, but it can end anywhere in free space, so I'll end the line by clicking just off to the side. Right now, this is just a plain old line, and to turn it into a command line, we will select it and then turn our attention to the Command Parameters section of the ribbon bar. Here, we will check the box for First or Last, select First from the drop-down menu, and then click Apply. That just turned the white normal line into a gray command line. This process tells the software that you want to start each layer from this point on the trace, but the extruder will not follow the path of this gray command line. Now, imagine the extruder starts at this point, and then moves in the clockwise direction around the exterior walls. Eventually, it will go all the way around and circle back to this point here, on the other side of the break. That's perfect, but now we need to print the infill material, so we will draw another line connecting the endpoint of the exterior wall to the nearest point of infill material. Unlike the gray command line, we actually want the extruder to move along the path of this new line we've drawn. So we will select the new line and go back up to the far left side of our ribbon bar, 
and click the For Print button. You'll notice the line turns blue when we do this. Unlike gray command lines, which do not represent a path the extruder will follow, the extruder will move along the path of the blue line. The only difference between the blue line we just created and the green lines which make up the trace is that the green lines tell the printer to pump material out of the extruder while moving, while the blue lines tell the printer to continue moving along the path, but without extruding any print material. This helps prevent over-extrusion, or depositing too much print material in one area. Now that we've connected the exterior trace line to the infill trace line, we can imagine the extruder would continue moving along the path of this green infill trace line, until eventually, it reaches the end of the layer. Now that we've reached the end of the layer, can you guess what we need to do? We need to tell the software that this is the last point, or end, of the layer, using another command line. We'll start by drawing a line from this endpoint to any other point in free space, go up to the Command Parameters section of our ribbon bar, and check First or Last, select Last from the drop-down menu, click Apply, and we can see that just turned the line gray. And that's it! We're done with drawing. Now it's time to validate our drawing and export the G-code. To do this, simply select the whole drawing and click the validation button in the top right side of the ribbon bar. We can see at the bottom of the window that validation was successful. Now we can click export in the ribbon bar, name the file, and click export. Now that we've successfully exported the G-code, Let's jump into the simulator and watch it print in real time. This simulator is the exact same as the printer's control interface, so this process of loading the G-code into the simulator is the exact same as the process of loading the G-code when you're actually in the field operating the 3D printer. To load the G-code, click Select File in the top left corner of the window and double-click on the G-code file we just exported. Now, you can see the trace line around the 3D printer and the time it will take to print each layer, also called the lap time, at the top of the screen. Press the Start Printing button on the top left side of the simulator and watch the printer go to work. If we zoom in a little closer, you can see that after the extruder reaches the start point, it will turn to reorient itself, the spatula will drop down, and the gray print material will begin to appear. Pretty cool, right? Although this real-time simulator is kind of fun to watch, it's also an essential tool used to verify that the G-code was properly made before ever going out into the field. Here, we're looking for a couple of main things. First, we want to take a look at this dashed green line, which indicates that the smoothing spatula will be engaged in the downward position. The spatula should only be engaged on the perimeter layers that make up the exposed faces of the walls, and then it should disengage or go up when the infill is being printed. If the spatula remained engaged while printing the infill, then it would break the connection between the infill and the perimeter layers, which is not something that we want. Here we can see the dashed line is positioned on the outside of the finished walls, which is exactly what we want to see. The dashed line also is not present around the infill trace, which again, is exactly what we want to see. I want to point out that back in AutoCAD, we never had to tell the software to engage the spatula in this way. This is because our software was smart enough to assume that we wanted a smooth finish by default, identify which surfaces the spatula will need to be engaged, and then automatically apply all of the relevant commands without wasting a second of our time. In addition to the spatula, we also want to use the simulator to assess the printer's movement. As the extruder approaches a corner, we want to see a gradual deceleration just before the turn, and then the extruder should accelerate just after it leaves the corner. Think about it like turning a car at an intersection. Smaller and lighter sports cars are more nimble, so they can make tighter turns more quickly, while larger and heavier semi-trucks must take wider turns more slowly, 
because of inertia. It's simple physics. Larger, heavier objects take longer to change direction. And this is why smaller and lighter printers like Frank can print perfect 90 degree corners very quickly, while most larger and heavier gantry printers are not capable of printing a perfect 90 degree corner at all, regardless of the speed. The last thing we want to assess is the extruder's rotation as it changes direction. Here, we can see the extruder rotating to conform with the curves of the serpentine infill pattern, which is exactly what we want to see. Now, let's recap what we've learned so far about creating G-code. First, we draw lines which correspond with the building's exterior walls. Next, we merge the lines together and use the patterns generator to create the green trace pattern. Then, we define our first point using a gray command line. Next, we connect our exterior trace lines to our infill trace lines using a blue line. Then, we define our last point using a gray command line, select the entire drawing, validate, and export the drawing to G-code. It can be done very quickly and easily thanks to the help of our AutoCAD plugin. Now, you may be asking yourself, I know how to make the G-code, but how do I get Frank to print this wall in the exact spot I need on the foundation? Great question, and thankfully, there's a simple answer. Essentially, we need to identify two points in the 3D AutoCAD model, which correspond with two known points on the building's foundation you should be able to locate these two points on the building's foundation, or slab, and use something like a permanent marker to physically draw or mark the location of these two points accurately. We call these two points the anchor points. The idea is to find and record the coordinates of these two anchor points in the digital AutoCAD model. Then, later on, when the printer is on the construction site, the operator will move the extruder so it's hovering directly above the first physical anchor point that's marked on the foundation, and then will input the coordinates from the first digital anchor point from the AutoCAD model. We call this process snapping the anchor points to the slab. Then, this snapping process is repeated for the second anchor point on the foundation. With these two points, the printer can determine where it's physically located on the foundation and then automatically reposition the toolpath so the wall gets printed in precisely the right location. This may sound simple, but that's only because Frank the printer is doing all of the difficult calculations, while the person operating the printer in the field just has to copy and paste two coordinates. It's quick and easy for the operator, but as you're about to learn, there's a lot more Frank is doing behind the scenes to make sure everything goes perfectly and with minimal effort from the operator. So how do we determine these two coordinates in the first place? It's easy. To begin, we want to determine a good location for those two anchor points. The first anchor point is the most critical because it's used to determine the offset distance between the printer and the entire toolpath. A good place for the first anchor point would be a hard corner near the perimeter of the foundation that would be easy for the operator in the field to pinpoint and physically mark on the building's foundation. Imagine this square represents the building's foundation. Now, let's say our intention is to print the walls we just created on the foundation in precisely this location. Any of these corners would make an ideal first anchor point because they are easily identifiable in the 3D model, and an operator in the field can very easily find and mark this physical location on the slab. However, this corner of the building is rounded and does not match up with the corner of the foundation, so using a random point along this curve as an anchor point could introduce some human error, because the printer operator in the field may find it more difficult to accurately find and mark the corresponding physical location on the slab. 
let's say we choose this corner in the southwest section of the foundation is our first anchor point, and this corner in the northwest section of the foundation is our second anchor point. To find the coordinates of this first anchor point in the 3D model, simply draw a new line that starts from this corner and ends anywhere else in the drawing. Just like with command lines, the start point of the line is all that matters here. Then, select the line and turn your attention to the Properties window. And right here, you can find the X and Y coordinates at the precise point where this line starts. We will copy these X and Y coordinates and record them in a safe location. The best point to save the coordinates is actually within the G-code file itself. I'll do this by opening up the G-code file, and I'm going to ignore all of the G-code that you see here. Don't delete it, don't change it, just ignore it, and paste the coordinates right at the very top of the document. I'll write here, first point coordinates, so the operator knows what these coordinates are for. And then I'll sandwich everything I just typed between some open and close brackets, which tell the printer to ignore this text between the brackets. This is not coding. I'm simply pasting some notes for the printer operator at the top of the document. Now, I'll click Save and return to AutoCAD to get the second point coordinates. Again, we will draw a line that starts from the corner point, then look up the coordinates in the Properties window, copy the coordinates, and then paste them into our G-code document between the brackets, just like we did before. Don't forget to label it Second Point Coordinates, and then save the file. Now, you may be wondering why we are recording XY Cartesian coordinates when the printer operates in polar coordinates. The reason is to simplify your life, and the printer operator's life, because you're probably most familiar with the XY coordinate system, and don't want to waste time doing the extra step in AutoCAD to convert to polar coordinates. However, when the operator types the XY coordinates into Frank's user interface, the printer immediately translates them into polar coordinates, and for good reason. I'll give you a quick glimpse into Frank's brain to see why. The operator in the field will use the manual controls to jog the extruder over the first physical anchor point marked on the foundation, and then input those first point coordinates. When this is done, the printer automatically correlates the first anchor point in the digital model with the extruder's current position. In doing so, the printer calculates the distance and direction, or R theta, of that first anchor point with respect to the printer's central pivot point, or orientation point. Now, the printer has snapped this corner of the drawing to the foundation, but without a second anchor point, the drawing could be rotated at any angle around this first anchor point. That's why a second anchor point is used so the printer can determine how the drawing is oriented with respect to the first anchor point. Then, the printer operator will use the manual controls to repeat the process by jogging the printer directly over the second anchor point and inputting the second point coordinates. This allows Frank to automatically calculate an offset value between the coordinates in the digital model and the printer's current position and that offset value is automatically applied to every coordinate along the trace, so the toolpath will be positioned in exactly the right location. All of this happens in a split second, and it's this process that makes accurately positioning the walls such a seamless procedure. Now, here's the cool part. The extruder can technically be hovering over any point along this edge of the foundation, and so long as the extruder is on this line, the same second point coordinates can be used to achieve the same result. It doesn't matter if the extruder is here, here, or all the way over here, because in Frank's mind, this second anchor point is only used to determine the angle at which the drawing is rotated around the first anchor point, 
And as long as the extruder is somewhere along the edge of the slab in this direction, the drawing's angle of rotation does not change. So the second point coordinates do not need to change either. As you can probably imagine, this makes it really quick and easy for the printer operator to accurately snap the G-code to the slab, and it reduces the probability that the operator will accidentally snap the G-code in the wrong position. It also makes it really easy to snap the walls in the correct location with millimeter accuracy. Another thing that you may have noticed is that this whole process of snapping the G-code to the slab means that you don't have to waste time trying to perfectly position the printer in a specific location on the foundation to get the same result. As long as the entire wall or toolpath falls within the printable area, you're free to move the printer to the most convenient location. For example, Let's say the G-code developer originally expected to have the printer positioned here on the foundation, but when the operator gets into the field, they see a plumbing vent or drain pipe coming up through the slab right where the printer is supposed to be positioned. Normally, this would be a big problem, but the operator can now simply park the printer right next to the vent pipe because from this new position, the entire wall section is still within the same printable area. Nothing changes. The operator will perform the same calibration procedure to accurately snap the G-code to the foundation in the same amount of time and with the same quality. What could have been a major headache is no longer a concern. Before we move on to the next section, I want to mention that we've only begun to scratch the surface of what this software is capable of. For example, you can add doors and windows with only a few simple clicks, leverage a robust suite of advanced commands to optimize print speed and quality, and you can even upload G-code and view every layer of your building in 3D right here in the printer's user interface or simulator we've used earlier. With that being said, if you do not feel comfortable creating your own G-code, that's fine. Our team of certified G-code developers are standing by to help transform your architectural plans into some beautifully optimized G-code so you don't have to. If you do decide to create some G-code of your own and want our team to review and optimize it before you print it in the field, we can do that for you as well. We offer affordable hourly rates for G-code development and revisions, and we're happy to help your project succeed. However, if you want to become an expert and master the art of developing G-code, then keep an eye out for our G-code certification course. Whether you want to create G-code for your own private business or as a member of our team of certified developers, we encourage you to enroll in the G-code certification course. We plan to offer this course by the end of this year. We'll see you in the next lesson.